Good morning, everybody. Full house in-house, full house online. This is good. It's good to see everybody in the room today and good to see you online as well. So I wanted to go over uh, one of my projects that we started really back in the mid 2000s and uh, really focusing on broom sedge management. And initially, uh, like most of my experiments, I think we're gonna have something that's gonna be fairly easy to tackle uh, when I first started this out. And I'll explain why it's been a little bit more difficult than I anticipated uh, initially. So broom sedge in general, we're talking about clump forming species that live about three to five years, sometimes a little bit longer, sometimes a little bit less. One of the reasons I thought it was gonna be fairly easy because I only saw about three species when I was looking at pastures initially. And I quickly learned there's about 19. Thankfully, only about half of them are in this part of the state, but still, when you're trying to give recommendations across the board, it's a little bit more difficult because species, as we will fit, find out in a minute, do respond a little bit differently. They're usually pretty evident in the fall because of the brown stems. And if you don't mow sometime in the late fall, they're usually hanging out until this time of the year and they'll start degrading and disappear towards the summer months. So there's a little bit of nomenclature I wanna go over too, because we call these grasses, these clump forming grasses, broom sedge, but we also have sedge species as well. So sedges can actually be controlled by one herbicide, well, two herbicides, one's Outrider and one's Sandia, two different active ingredients, and they control sedges, but they do not control broom sedge. So if you don't know the difference between a broom sedge grass versus a sedge, it's all related to the structure of the plant. So the cross section of the sedge stem will be triangular in shape, and because of that, the leaves are what they refer to as being three ranked. They come off in three directions, where grasses, stems tend to be round or flattened, and, and leaves are two ranked in general. All right, so when I started looking at this research back in the late 2000s, um, started looking at some of the results from other research that's been done in the US. In the Midwest, uh, they found that uh, fescue pastures that were fertilized with nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium were fertilized over a five year period. They did see a broom sedge decrease in those pastures. And another study, tilling to three inch depth plus 100 pounds the acre of N. Uh, decrease uh, broom sedge density in Bermuda grass in the Midwest. But in general, if you look at extension reports from even in the Southeast, they all said it was something to do with low fertility. And many, in fact, have implicated low pH. So I teamed up with our county faculty throughout uh, this portion of the state and went around to different pastures that were infested with broom sedge and sampled the plants and then sampled also the soil to get an idea of what we're looking at as far as uh, pH or phosphorus levels and the, even some micronutrients. So if you look across the board from Hardy, Polk County, Okeechobee, Highlands County, Manti um, here at the center and then Glades and DeSoto, pH is all over the place, from 4.1 all the way to 7.8. And each of these pastures did have a broom sedge species in them. What was unique was the soda with being a pH of 7.8, it was a completely different species that was not present in any of the other sites. And that's actually one of our experimental sites I'll be talking about in a second. Another site in Polk County, where the pH was 6.0, the phosphorus is really high. And they had applied uh, biosolids in that pasture and they started seeing decline in broom sedge density over about a three year period. Another thing that we detected was some copper and that was not present in any of the other sites as well. So <clears throat> pH is not necessarily the reason what else is going on, we weren't really sure. 
but we knew some species might respond to soil pH. So um, Andrea's son actually did a science fair project here at the center about the same time we we're starting this. And we um, amended soils. So we, we took our native soil, four and a half. We amended it with lime to get pH levels of five and a half and six and a half and transplanted purple blue stem seedlings into these pots and monitored height of those burn sedge plants over time. And you definitely see in the native soils, the purple blue stem did grow quite well, but where we increased the pH, there is a significant reduction in the broom sedge height. Okay, so with some species, we can optimize soil pH and start to take care of the problem. But looking back at our original data set from our sampling from across many of the counties, we just had additional questions. Does phosphorus have a role? Is it copper? Or is it something else completely? Or is it a combination of these factors? So we started experiments in 2012. We had one here at the center, one in Arcadia, and then one in St. Cloud. And the St. Cloud location, I'm not gonna share any data with because we virtually had no response, unfortunately. <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about that later as well. So we had a two by two by two factorial treatment where we had lime versus no lime, uh, 50 pounds of N, 25 pounds of P or 50 pounds of K applied on 10, 5, 10. And then we had a micronutrient package with 503G as well. We counted brew such plants annually in four locations within each plot. These plots were in general, about 100 by 100 in nature. So fairly large plots, just because we wanted to account for the spatial distribution of broom sedge across the pasture. And we did collect soil and tissue samples in the fall. I'm not gonna report on that as well. I'm more interested in the broom sedge response today. And at Ona, we applied lime in 2012 and 2018. Arcadia, because the pH was at 7.8, we only applied elemental sulfur hoping to decrease our pH. Um, we, only, we applied 100 pounds of sulfur per acre per year in, in those plots. In St. Cloud, the pH was exactly where it needed to be for Bahia grass, so we applied no lime. So we're just looking at the NPK and the micronutrients there. Okay, so just a little bit more background information on each of these locations. Um, soil pH at Arcadia was 7.7. .7. We did have a little bit of P and K, uh, no copper. And that species which was bushy blue stem. I can get this to show up. So if you're not sure about the species, this is what this would look like. It tends to be more bright green uh, without hairs. I tend to see this more on roadsides especially highly engineered growth size where the pH is really high. The Ona location was purple blue stem. Again, we did have a little bit of phosphorus, but pretty low, uh, some potassium, but no micronutrients whatsoever. And then at St. Cloud was just the general, what we call broom sedge blue stem. pH was five and a half no micronutrients, very low phosphorus. And unfortunately, we didn't see much of a response there, but I'll go into that in a second. Okay, in Arcadia, uh, so this was the bush, bushy blue stem. We applied sulfur every year um, and micronutrients and NPK. This was the site that we saw a, a response from NPK applications within a year after application. So this is actually pretty shocking to me. I wasn't expecting that quick of a response. Um, <clears throat> but you do see in general, uh, pretty much a decline throughout the years over an eight year period, except for 2017, where we had a little bit of a jump in the broom sedge density. And if you remember, I said that these species live about three to five years. So I think we're dealing with a fluctuation in the population just because of that. So we likely have a lot of seedlings germinate every year. The cows probably do graze those seedlings pretty well. 
So I think that's why we did see a decline then following years in 18, 19, and 20. In Ona, we did not see a response for NPK or our micronutrients, uh, but we did see a Lyme response uh, within about three years uh, after application. <clears throat> we do notice that we do see an increase from 2015 to 2019 um, with alley Lyme, but we held pretty steady throughout the years where we did have the Lyme applications. And remember that we did have two applications, one in 2012 and one in 2018 of Lyme. So we're not seeing any additive effects from the second application, but we're re trying to maintain our soil pH at five and a half. All right, so I'm a little curious about um, the Turner population, the bushy blue stem, that's not Arcadia. Uh, the bushy blue stem population, which, where we did see an NP and K response. And in general, we didn't see an NP and K response at ONA except for two years, which I'm not showing because it was, it went back and forth. So I was really curious then, well, is it the N, is it the P, or is it the K that's giving us an impact on our broom sedge populations? So we started another study in 2017. We're using the same rates that we used, 50 pounds and 25 and, and 50 of NP and K respectively, but at two different locations, uh, one in Ona, one at Buck Island Ranch, and our treatments were nitrogen by itself, phosphorus by itself, or potassium by itself, and then and nitrogen with phosphorus, nitrogen with potassium, potassium, phosphorus with potassium, all three together and then in untreated. So at Buck Island, we did not see a response from P or N at any point in time, but we did see an overall potassium response. So without potassium, within three years, we see almost a decrease of 50% of our broom size population of at um, Buck Island. And this was a broom sedge, broom, broom sedge blue stem population, which was similar to that at St. Cloud, where we saw no response. Um, <clears throat> and then at Ona, a little bit different in Ona because in, before we started this experiment, we had investigated the past year and saw it had a lot of smut grass, so we sprayed Velpar on it, trying to get rid of the smut grass. And this is the only time, and the only time since then I've seen this, is that broom sedge was actually killed in a lot of our plots from the Velpar application. Um, don't know what happened. I think the sun, the moon, the stars all aligned, because um, I have not seen that since. But, so we ended up with a really low population in 2018. We did see a rebound in the broom sedge overall, but when we did have potassium applied to those plots, we did see a significant reduction again um, from 2019 to 2022 in the broom sedge population. Okay, so I wanted to go over this and talk about this a little bit. So in St. Cloud, we had no impact whatsoever from either, well, we didn't apply Lyme from NPK or micronutrients, but why? I think a lot of it came down to how these plots were managed. At Arcadia and here at Ona, we tried to mow these plots every fall before seed set. At St. Cloud, I don't believe that ever happened. So there's some defoliation going on, mowing every year, which may or may not be happening at St. Cloud. In other states, like I talked about earlier, they did see some impact from applying phosphorus. So why is that not occurring here? If you think about the hay grass and how in our spodic horizon in the soil, they're able to mine that phosphorus. The hay grass is able to mine that phosphorus. So adding phosphorus in our case probably isn't going to help unless um, the tissue concentration is below 0.15%. And even then, it may not 
have the effect that we're seeing here. Limine, um, in some cases, like we saw with purple blue stem, it can have an impact. I think a lot of the species that we see in the native rangeland, um, like chalky blue stem and some of those other blue stems that we see there, if they're in your bahia grass pasture, limine would definitely have an effect because we know they like to grow in their native soils and that pH is gonna be around four and a half. So limine could have an impact, but you need a soil test first and make sure that the pH is at five and a half, which is required for bahia grass. And in general, I think it's really gonna take a multi-pronged approach. Uh, we gotta look at our fertility, make sure our pH is right, and then soil tests to look at our phosphorus, or especially our potassium levels, and uh, may have to include defoliation, mowing, intensive grazing, uh, something like that. One thing we have not looked at yet is tillage, and that's something that uh, I'm interested in looking at if time permits, and then um, incorporating herbicide applications, either spot treatment or wiping, see if we can take it to that next step where we can actually decrease to nearly zero in the pastures. I wanna go back one second. So in this experiment, um, talking to Maria Silvera, which is actually one of my co-PIs on this project, um, she suggested that I look at this a little bit differently. We go back, and analyze this based on a treatment number. So instead of separating out the N, P, and K for the analysis, and basically what I found was that it was all over the board. And in general, analyzing it, so you look at the individual responses, it does tell the better story. So how do we go about controlling it then? Because we know we don't have a selective herbicide that we can spray across the pasture that's gonna give us a consistent result. Um, we're looking at basically spot treatment or wiping. And uh, usually we're looking at a 10% volume to volume solution of glyphosate. It's pretty important that you do wipe this in two directions. And if you've ever used a wiper, a lot of people in the state have bought one and they've used it once and didn't like the results and it went underneath the barn or just sat out in the lot and never got used again. And <clears throat> what I've found is that it's more of an art than it is a science when you're using a wiper. You can practice and practice and practice and make yourself better. And a lot of times it's about keeping the wiper saturated. So you have enough solution that's actually gonna wipe on your target species. So if you're new to this, I think adding a foam marker solution to the tank and the foam will actually build up on the roller, then you'll be able to see that your wiper is actually wet enough and that you're actually making, getting some herbicide onto those plants. So we did do this here at the center uh, a few years ago. This is actually before uh, one of our grazing experiments that was done here. Uh, this was done in August as the stems were elongating right before flowering. And it was wiped in two directions and the grazing experiment had to start pretty quickly. So it got mowed about two weeks after the wiping application, which I thought was a little bit too early and I didn't think we'd get that much results. Uh, one year after treatment, we had about 70% control, they wiped again the following fall. And this is two years after wiping, the same pasture, same viewpoint, and a pretty good job overall. So either we had a really good applicator or they practiced a lot, but I think it was just, you know, good luck. So I think to summarize, I mean, Increasing foot soil fertility can help, uh, but I think it's really important that you do a soil test first. Uh, without that soil test and without, without your baseline data, your soil pH, your P levels and your K levels especially, <clears throat> I think you're just taking a blind approach. Um, if you think about 
the data that I shared today, I shared eight years in one experiment and five years in the other. This is not something that happens overnight. It's going to take some time uh, for the paya grass and the and broom sedge to respond. And it's not going to necessarily eliminate the broom sedge. I didn't have any plots where we went to zero without a herbicide treatment. So wiping is an option that I think people need to consider. But I do think we have opportunities to do some more research on this. So roller chopping followed by fertilization. Um, we have done this with smut grass in the past with the fall roller chopping, and we decreased our smut grass populations to levels similar to that with a Velpar application the previous year but we had perfect conditions for that smut grass control of Velpar, okay? What about multiple mowing cycles? I don't know which is cheaper, the fertilizer or the mowing right now, but it's probably neck and neck in cost. But if you look at areas that have been mowed repeatedly and you go right next door that never gets mowed, you definitely see a, a difference in the amount of broom sedge in those pastures. So how many mowing cycles that takes, I don't know. But I do think mowing does have an impact on broom sedge densities in pastures. And then increased grazing pressure. Is there a way that we can optimize our grazing to help us get rid of those seedling broom sedge species, the broom sedge plants? If we can, then over time, we should transition that pasture away from broom sedge into more bahia grass especially if we are implementing some fertility. Okay, I hope everybody has questions because I am pretty much finished. It was a pretty quick seminar, but I did want to give you an update because it's been a couple of years since I had given an update on this. And um, that's where we are today. Going to continue this work. Uh, this work was funded by the Florida Cattle Enhancement Board over the last several years now, minus a couple, but um, this has been a fun project. It's been a little bit challenging, but definitely not as challenging as smut grass has been. Okay, I have a few questions online already, but do we have any from the room? Stone Cold Silence. What do I think is going to happen with the tillage approach? It's a good question. I think we'll get rid of what's there. And um, I think we'll have a bunch of seedlings, right? So I think if we incorporate fertility along with the tillage operation, I think we'll be better than just tilling and leaving it alone, right? Um, I think we'll get a, a bunch of seedlings. If we graze it right, I think we can possibly help transition that back into pure bahia grass. Awesome. Okay, so the question in the room is about electronic soil testing. Um, it's kind of out of my area, but from what I understand, is soil sampling is still the preferred method for us, for IFAS. I don't think they've been proven. Yeah. yeah. Soil specialists in the room have any comments? Yeah, still a long way to go with the sensors. Okay, um, can grazing management affect young broom sedge populations? I think I've already answered that, but in general, I think it can. And did you use UAN as a carrier on your Velpar treatments? And so that's a good question. Um, so when we were trying to control broom sedge, or not broom sedge, when we were trying to call, control smut grass in the owner location back in 2017, we did not use UAN as a carrier. Will it have an impact? possibly have not seen that yet. Have you looked at any potential biocontrol agents for broom sedge? Uh, we have not, and the likelihood of that 
happening was probably going to be pretty slim because most of these species are native and there are some that are not very numerous in the state so i'm sure that they probably won't like a biocontrol agent on the broom sedge plants besides belpar have you looked at any other promising herbicide options um that's another good question there's only other one other herbicide or maybe two that i can think of that would have activity on broom sedge but it's going to be on a pre-emergence basis uh, one of those is Prowl H2O. Uh, the active ingredient in that is pentamethylin, and it's very subjective to environmental conditions. If you don't get any rainfall after a Prowl H2O application, it's not going to work. And you're looking at about 4.1 quarts per acre per application, so it's not going to be a very cheap option. And <clears throat> when we'd have to apply it, it would be um, pretty much now. We're in our dry season. If you can figure out when it's gonna rain, <laughs> talk to me. Um, the other one is a, a product called Resilon. Unfortunately, it's not labeled in this part of the state. Um, it's another pre-emergence option, but it's more for the Northern part of the state at this point in time. We have no data on that species, just looking at what species it does control. I think it would be an option if it were to come here. But again, it's pre-emergence. It does have an advantage over Prowl H2O is that it doesn't break down. It will sit there until we do get rainfall and then it'll become activated and then work. So that could be an option in the future. Okay, one more question online. If mowing, when is the best time to mow? That is a great question. And I don't know that I have an answer for that. Um, I think in general, we want to mow before seed set so we can prevent seed production. But as far as impacting longevity of that clump, we don't know that answer yet. Okay. Any other questions? What's the nutritive value on broom sedge is regrowing, and I have never looked that up. Um, I'm sure somebody has it. I know NRCS has it, especially for the desirables, right? So chalky blue stem would be one of the desirables. Um, they actually call them decreasers in native rangeland because the cattle will go to them and graze them. So there are some that have pretty good nutritive value. Is it as good as our improved forage? Is probably not, but it's better than a lot of things. Okay, one more question online, it just showed up. When mowing increased tillers? That's a good question too. Um, because of the way clump forming grasses grow, they tend to start in the center and grow outward. And as it grows outward, the center dies back. So in general, probably shouldn't increase tillers um, unless it's a very young plant, then you could. So it's a big mature clump then we're probably not going to increase tillers, but if it's a um, younger plant, you could. All right, anything else in the room? All right, well, if not, um, I appreciate everyone for attending. Andrea has some more information for those of us online. Okay, and just a small, um, uh, just a note to you all, the phone number, our local phone number ending in 1314 is presently not working. Uh, hopefully that will get resolved sooner than later. But um, just wanted to let you know about that so that you don't get frustrated when you try to reach us and you can't. The best way by far is email. So I just wanted to share with you all um, some upcoming events for you to be mindful of. Um, okay, so our next ONA highlight is going to be the 11th of April, and that is going to be with the South Florida Beef Forge Program Group. 
Um, Laura Bennett and Kaylin Royal are going to be sharing about some of the opportunities with the South Florida Bee Forge group. So that'll be awesome to check out. So I hope you can participate with that. And whenever I send you the recording of today's own highlight, I'm going to include information for this one so you can register as well as these brochures that I'm about to share for some upcoming events. You'll get those as well. So the first one that's coming up on April the 6th in Polk County, I believe, is the Pasture and Grazing Management Seminar. That's an evening program. And the registration fee is $10, and that includes supper and the materials that they're going to be sharing with you. The next one is April the 13th. That is at Circle B Bar Reserve Meeting Room in Lakeland. And it is an environmental program, environmental lands management and tour. And that's a full day. Now that one, I believe there is a $50 registration fee and that includes lunch and a handbook. We hope that you can join us on April the 20th here at the center for our next field day. It will be a full day with morning talks. We're gonna have our sponsors with booths, some refreshments. Our students are gonna have posters displayed showing their research. Then we're gonna to join together for an opening assembly and we're gonna hear from Dr. Sellers, Dr. Engel and Wes Carlton. Then we're gonna have some morning presentations, a wonderful steak lunch, followed by an afternoon field tour. Registration fee is $30. And um, that will go fast. We are a little bit limited on space. So sign up soon if you plan to attend. Then we have um, these programs. I didn't share both of them. One is going to be held in Sarasota, Sarasota County. And it's a ranching foundations program. And the other is going to be held in Hillsborough County. And these are a little ways out. This one is May 16th. And the other one is June 1st. I will share both of those flyers with you whenever I share this information. If you're not already doing so, do consider following us. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and we have a very active YouTube page with all of these um, own highlights are on there, as well as our past field day talks and some, some guest speakers as well. And if you do not already get our Friday newsy emails, we invite you to join that. Just send me an email at ona at ifis.ufl.edu and we will get you on the list so you can stay in touch and hear about all the wonderful things being done here and with the South Florida Bee Forge group. So that's all we have for today and we hope to see you in April. Thank you.